Actually, the reason the universe exists, from my standpoint, is what we're doing right here now. We're living these lives. Uh, the point that I try and make is that we can lead the, live these lives better when we realize that we're more than just one little physical incarnation birth to death. What happens after you die? Is there life after death? Which version of the afterlife makes the most sense? These are significant questions for many, but the answers can really be straightforward. After this life ends, a new one begins. This is called reincarnation. But is reincarnation real? While science can't prove or disprove the idea of life after death. I do believe that um, reincarnation should be taken seriously. Famous podcaster Joe Rogan recently said that the concept of reincarnation is not only wrong, but it's even terrifying. So let's dive into what reincarnation is and why it's wrong. The concept of reincarnation, not the concept of reincarnation like coming back as a butterfly or something <clears> like that, but the concept of living your life over and over and over again until you get it right. Reincarnation suggests that there's more to life than just the present moment. While the specifics vary across belief systems, the core idea is that when you die, something akin to your soul will transition into a new physical form. The person who is dying, their consciousness is separated from their brain, and then also, somehow, it's conveyed to the living person. Your current body has a limited lifespan, but the essential aspect of your being, the inner essence, endures. For many, this belief is foundational to their understanding of reality, spirituality, and the workings of the universe. The term reincarnation has Latin roots, translating to entering the flesh again. Some may also use the term transmigration. Ancient Greece had its variation known as metempsychosis, while others simply called it rebirth. Stories of reincarnations in all faiths. Um, it is a common human experience. Reincarnation for many is viewed as a cyclical and perpetual phenomenon, occurring repeatedly, possibly indefinitely. To explain the idea of the reincarnation is the continuum of the mind. In certain interpretations, a soul can be reborn not only into another human body, but also into an animal, plant, or even a transcendental figure. In Buddhism and Hinduism, prominent religions where reincarnation plays a significant role, it's intricately tied to the concept of karma. Positive thoughts and actions are believed to generate positive karma, ensuring a favorable outcome in the next life. The ceaseless cycle of reincarnation is termed samsara in these traditions, roughly meaning a wandering world. The ultimate aim is to break free from samsara, attaining absolute self-knowledge, enlightenment, and liberation, referred to as nirvana by Buddhists. A lot of people would say nirvana, a number of people would say enlightenment. Are they the same or are they different? To be honest, it has to go back what's actually Buddhist belief. The Buddhists believe in something called the cycle of rebirth or samsara. This cycle that we are living in right now called us to be reborn again and again and again. However, reincarnation isn't necessarily forgiving, often involving prolonged and continued experiences of suffering. In Buddhism, the Baba Chakra, or Wheel of Life, serves as a central visual depiction of samsara, representing what followers must break free from in order to attain nirvana. The wheel is divided into six sections or realms, many of which are immersed in suffering, physical pain, mental anguish, and social injustice. These collectively create the challenging path that a reincarnated soul must traverse repeatedly. a similar perspective is found in historical groups like the Orphics, 
Orphism, an ancient Greek religion, portrays reincarnation more as a punishment than a reward. According to Orphix, upon death, one either ascends to godliness or is reincarnated back to earth. What's noteworthy is that some claimed physical evidence for reincarnation suggests significant suffering in whatever preceded our current lives. Dr. Jim B. Tucker, a child psychiatrist at the University of Virginia School of Medicine and director of the university's Division of Perceptual Studies, rigorously evaluates empirical evidence indicating that consciousness survives death, emphasizing the distinctness of mind and brain. His work positions him as a global authority on children recalling their past lives, instances where children say or do things implying a continuation of a previous existence. From the age of three, James's parents began to hear stories from their son that shocked them, that their son was recalling things that connected him to a Navy pilot who died in 1945. They might recognize someone they've never met before, talk about an event they seemingly couldn't have known about because it occurred before their birth, or even directly mention details about their previous death. In some instances, there are reports of physical birthmarks aligning with the recounted claims, often tied to some form of violent injury or fatal accident related to a past life. One of Dr. Tucker's notable cases hit the headlines in the mid-2010s. Ryan, an American boy from the Midwest, asserted that he was once an actor in 1930s Hollywood. His mother closely followed her son's narrative as he gradually shared more details. Ryan recalled working as an agent and dancer in New York, mentioning having three sons and remembered specific details like names of friends and significant addresses. Responding to the tidbits of information, Ryan's mother reportedly acquired books with 1930s Hollywood photos. They sifted through until Ryan identified a picture he claimed showed him as an extra alongside another man named George, an image of the actual actor George Raft. Many of Ryan's other claims could be verified. Dr. Tucker and Ryan's family delved deeper until they found out that the extra he claimed to be was a man named Martin, also known as Marty. Martin had been a bit of a part actor, then a dancer, and eventually an agent. He did indeed have three sons. Based on numerous interviews with Dr. Tucker, Ryan's experience isn't unique. There are thousands of similar cases, not counting those never thoroughly examined. Understandably, there's a taboo surrounding past life memories. Many parents are hesitant about their children inheriting memories of trauma. Dr. Tucker's studies reveal that the average past life age of death is just 28, with almost three quarters involving violent, frightening, or unnatural deaths, indicating potential trauma in recalling such information. Moreover, some parents may not realize that their children's imaginative stories could be rooted in actual historical events. As for how this phenomenon occurs, Dr. Tucker has mentioned a possible link with our evolving understanding of quantum mechanics. Today we know that delving deep into the subatomic level and beyond disrupts the laws of physics. The true existence of anything is contingent on observation, suggesting a potential separation of brain and mind, body and consciousness. The core idea is that consciousness might persist beyond the death of the brain. Dr. Tucker as the director of the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies, has long advocated that consciousness is distinct from our physical cells. Past life regression, or past life hypnosis, is generally considered pseudoscience. While many claim to have had their past lives revealed through these methods, mainstream academics rarely accept these recollections as genuine. It's worth noting that cases involving children often require no hypnosis, and there is minimal contextual influence on what a child may remember about past lives. This approach is as close to authenticity as we might get. Traditional ideas on reincarnation have been revisited in recent years. The Egg is a short story by Andy Weir published in 2009. With insights from world religions, Dr. Tucker's research, and creative minds like Andy Weir, reincarnation might hold some truth. Weir, renowned for The Martian, which was later adapted into a Hollywood film starring Matt Damon in 2015, might find his lasting mark in theoretical science and philosophy through the egg. Weir himself has expressed surprise at the fervor surrounding his egg concept, a creation that took him less than an hour to jot down and share in an online forum. 
In our modern world, where the meaning of life seems increasingly elusive, perhaps it's not astonishing that the egg has gained traction. So what happens in the story? Weir's main character is simply referred to as you, and quickly you encounter God, identified as me. The story revolves around a conversation between you and God, which uncovers the true nature of reality. Initially, the disheartening news is that you've recently perished in a car crash. God clarifies this, but also discloses that you're on the verge of being reborn as someone else, specifically a young Chinese girl living almost 1,500 years ago. God goes on to reveal that this isn't your inaugural reincarnation. Far from it. You've been reborn countless times into various bodies, residing in all earthly locations throughout the past, present, and future. As you reflect on this, you realize you were once figures like Abraham Lincoln, Adolf Hitler, and even Jesus Christ. God points out that you've also been everyone else, including Lincoln's assassin, Hitler's victims, and Jesus' followers. God further explains that in reality, the universe serves as a framework crafted for you to navigate through every conceivable human experience. The revelation is that presently and essentially always, you transcend being merely the individual who met their end in a car crash at the apparent start. Instead, you embody everyone, everyone who has existed and everyone who will exist. In essence, the universe exists for you. Finally, God clarifies the rationale behind all of this. The concept is that by being everyone, you would grasp that every action you take is a reflection of yourself. Each time you cause harm to someone, you inflict harm upon yourself. Every instance of aiding someone is a form of self-assistance. Every moment you displayed kindness or hostility, happiness or sadness, selfishness or selflessness, you are essentially embodying all those traits as everyone. Every human experience throughout history and in the future becomes your own. According to the narrative, when you've lived through every conceivable human life, past, present, and future, you will ascend to become a deity, much like the one you're currently conversing with. Only then will you possess boundless wisdom about the true essence of existence. And so the tale concludes. For the reader, a distinct moral message emerges, implying that one should strive to always think, act, and be one's best self, not only for personal benefit, but because that best self is, fundamentally, you. Everything is you. So would you prefer everything to be positive or negative? Strangely, the narrative also hinges on the understanding that all individuals with negative tendencies are fundamentally your responsibility as well. This becomes a broad thought experiment with numerous possible conclusions. Meanwhile, the entire narrative serves as a journey toward your ultimate enlightenment and your ascent to a divine status. This is how Weir presents the universe as an egg, a place where you grow and evolve until you attain that stage. There are certain schools of philosophical and scientific thought that this narrative aligns with, or at the very least blurs the boundaries of. Eternalism, a philosophy of time, suggests that the flow of time is not a concrete reality. Instead of the universe, your life, and everything else progressing through time with the past behind, the present always in the moment, and the future ahead, eternalism proposes that all these states of time coexist. Time is more like a box to open and explore rather than a one-way path to traverse. In Weir's narrative, this is one of the initial significant revelations for you, the main character, when you underwent reincarnation in China 1,500 years ago. It's not precisely as if you traveled back in time. It's more like you'll have turned the pages of time to a different moment. Enter the theory of open individualism, another crucial idea in the broader concept of the egg. This theory suggests that you are everyone, or everyone is you. Over recent decades, various versions of this idea have emerged, often centered on dismantling the conventional understanding of the flow of time. Time, as commonly perceived, doesn't truly exist for the open individual. How else could you embody someone else entirely? Instead, one could understand that you, in essence, exist like a sheen over the world, encompassing all, or that every apparent individual person is interconnected through their shared experience of existence. Despite the feeling of diversity among us, at the most fundamental level, we're identical, quite literally the same. 
Theories of open individualism typically don't conclude the narrative. However, when the notion is presented that after experiencing life as everyone, you ascend to become a god, the egg takes on a more theological dimension, echoing similar concepts found in many major religions, particularly Hinduism. While most religions acknowledge a god or creator, an all-seeing, all-powerful deity, in Hinduism, there's the Brahman. It represents the topmost metaphysical layer, enveloping everything, including Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the trinity of supreme Hindu gods. The Brahman is beyond surpassing. It's the ultimate truth of all things. It remains unchanging, unchangeable, and embodies the ultimate reality. In Hindu philosophy, one interpretation of Weir's story could perhaps align the god figure within it with something akin to the Brahman, although the implication is that it exists somewhere else. So Weir doesn't neatly wrap up reality in precisely the same manner. But what's your take? Are you on board with the egg theory? Maybe you're intrigued, but find it challenging to fully embrace. Understandably, this isn't something that can offer concrete proof. It's a concept put forward by Weir, weaving together various approaches to life. Similarly, we might observe inklings of us incorporating elements of the egg into our envisioned future lives. The hive mind, for instance, is often discussed as an advanced technology that human society might be progressing toward, a unifying force enabling shared thinking, understanding, and possibly shared emotions. It's usually presented as a route to ultimate efficiency, but could it also guide us toward greater wisdom and expedite our journey to the end point of the egg? toward experiencing every conceivable human life? Or might a hive mind steer us away from that ultimate truth? In contemplating future technologies like this, it's easy to veer into a premature dystopia. However, and while interpretations may vary, that's likely not the primary message of the egg theory. Instead, it's about the limitless possibilities for life, a reimagining of the universe with you at its core. Not you as an individual, though. If the egg theory holds, then you are me, and I am them, and they are us. You, me, he, she, and they are evolving as one, with an entire expanse of time, past, present, and future, in which to do so. Now let's explore why reincarnation, according to some individuals, including Joe Rogan, is problematic and terrifying. The primary skepticism surrounding reincarnation centers on the absence of concrete empirical evidence supporting the concept. Unlike scientific theories that rely on observable and testable phenomena, the idea of reincarnation often hinges on subjective experiences, anecdotal accounts, and religious scriptures. Critics argue that these forms of evidence lack the reliability and consistency required to establish the validity of such a profound and far-reaching concept. Anecdotal evidence often comes in the form of individuals claiming to remember past lives. While some proponents point to these accounts as compelling proof of reincarnation, skeptics raise concerns about the reliability of such memories. Memories are inherently fallible and subject to distortion over time, influenced by a variety of psychological factors. Vivid dreams, false memories, or even a strong desire for continuity beyond one's current existence could contribute to the creation of narratives that align with the idea of past lives. Moreover, the subjective nature of these memories makes them challenging to verify independently. Unlike scientific experiments that can be replicated to validate results, the personal and internal nature of past life recollections places them outside the realm of objective scrutiny. Critics argue that without a robust and consistently replicable body of evidence, the foundation of reincarnation remains shaky and open to interpretation. In the absence of empirical evidence, skeptics maintain that the concept of reincarnation lacks the scientific rigor necessary for widespread acceptance. Scientific inquiry relies on a methodical approach, demanding evidence that can be examined, tested, and verified by multiple parties. The reliance on personal experiences and unverifiable memories falls short of meeting these rigorous standards, leading many to dismiss reincarnation as a belief system lacking empirical grounding. Another significant criticism of reincarnation centers on its ethical implications, particularly the concept of karma and the deterministic worldview associated with it. Karma, 
in the context of reincarnation suggests that one's actions in past lives influence their current circumstances. While proponents argue that this provides a sense of cosmic justice, skeptics contend that it oversimplifies the complex web of factors shaping an individual's life. Critics argue that attributing success or suffering solely to past actions neglects the multifaceted nature of human existence. Factors such as societal structures, genetics, and chance play significant roles in shaping an individual's life trajectory. The deterministic nature of karma implies a preordained path for each person, leaving little room for free will or agency in shaping one's destiny. Moreover, the ethical implications of karma raise questions about fairness and accountability. Critics assert that a system based on past life actions seems to lack compassion and understanding for individuals facing adversity. The idea that someone's current struggles are a direct result of their actions in a previous existence can be perceived as morally problematic, as it places blame on the individual rather than acknowledging external influences. The deterministic worldview associated with reincarnation can also lead to fatalistic attitudes. If one's current situation is solely a consequence of past actions, it may discourage efforts to address societal inequalities or work towards personal growth. Critics argue that a belief system emphasizing a predetermined destiny can hinder individuals from taking responsibility for their actions in the present and working towards positive change. Another significant critique of reincarnation revolves around the lack of a universally accepted definition and understanding of the concept. Different cultures and belief systems conceptualize reincarnation in diverse ways, making it challenging to establish a standardized framework for examination. This lack of consensus raises questions about the coherence and the consistency of the concept, contributing to skepticism among those who seek a more universally applicable understanding. The variation in interpretations of reincarnation across cultures and historical periods suggests that the concept may be shaped by cultural, social, and historical influences. Critics argue that this lack of a standardized definition undermines the credibility of reincarnation as a universal truth. Instead, it's seen as a product of specific cultural contexts, evolving over time and adapting to the beliefs and norms of different societies. Furthermore, the cultural and religious context in which reincarnation is embedded introduces subjective biases into discussions about its veracity. Individuals may be predisposed to accepting or rejecting reincarnation based on their cultural upbringing or religious background. This subjectivity challenges the objectivity required for a concept to be widely accepted, especially in academic and scientific circles, where a universal understanding is crucial. Skeptics highlight that the lack of a consistent and universally agreed-upon definition makes it difficult to engage in meaningful discourse about the validity of reincarnation. Without a clear and standardized framework, debates surrounding the concept often devolve into semantic disagreements, hindering progress in understanding its fundamental nature. So thanks for watching this video, but I'd like to know what's your take on this. Let me know in the comments section below.